thank you all for coming. Thank you all for um, being out here in the morning. Uh, I am not a morning person. Uh, but I am now with, uh, with a small business. I have to be. Um, how many of you have seen the I Am a Kentuckian video? Oh, pretty good show of hands. If you've not, um, you can check it out on Vimeo. Um, it's 90 seconds long. Uh, but it might be, uh, for me, some of the most beautiful 90 seconds of film that you ever see. It's got some beautiful faces saying very, very simple things. Uh, over a year ago, in what seemed like a whole nother lifetime, a uh, particular presidential candidate started stoking fears about immigrants and refugees. He warned of the dangerous terrorists hidden among refugees from Syria. At the time, this sounded like the alarmist pandering of a nationalist demagogue who would never in a million years make it into the White House. But at the time, it did fire me up, and I channeled my outrage in the best way I knew how at the time. I made a Facebook post. I found a mouth-watering picture of a spread of shawarma, kibbe, falafel, and fatouche, and I posted this simple sentence. I, for one, would love to see some Syrian food in Lexington. That sentence, by the way, encapsulates my entire worldview, better eating, through diversity. A friend and local do-gooder connected me with Kentucky Refugee Ministries, a local nonprofit that helps settle refugees into Lexington. Literally, they pick them up at the airport, they take them to their new furnished apartment, they help them navigate the grocery store, utilities, they hook them up with ESL classes, job training, all the things necessary to restore normalcy to people who have known nothing but war, upheaval and displacement. So when the good folks at KRM told me that they held an annual fundraiser, my first question was, what kind of food will there be? That's always my first question. From there, we devised a new fundraising paradigm. Instead of people writing a check, putting on a black tie, showing up at a catered event with fancy napkins and, and forks, uh, we thought, I thought, hey, there's some amazing home cooks in this refugee community. So we connected them with the restaurateurs here in Lexington, and we helped produce simple, authentic, delicious food for our patrons and fundraisers at this event. And thus was born Passport to Flavor. This was last year. We raised a ton of money, and everybody got to try really terrific food from Bhutan, Cuba, Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, Bosnia, and the Congo. More than that, I got to meet the people of this community, our community, and hear their stories. Stories that gave me new perspective and shook me out of my complacency. One anecdote that really sticks with me comes from the planning process from last year's event. We were at a KRM staffer's house, tasting food and going over recipes. Not the worst job in the world, let me tell you that. <laughs> I asked about one of the dishes, uh, our Congolese cook, Tatu. I said, I asked her, how did you make such a delicious cake? Through a translator, she explained that she took a deep pan, coated it with oil, poured the batter in, put another pan over it, put it in a pit that had branches and wood on it, covered the whole thing with more branches and wood, lit the whole thing on fire. And I thought for a second, oh, She's talking about an oven, an ad hoc oven. So I took her into the kitchen and I said, oh, check this out, here's, here's, here's the oven. And I realized very quickly she had never seen an oven before. And we had to really explain uh, how the thing works. Uh, at least not an oven that she didn't ingeniously improvise in a refugee camp. I don't think Gordon Ramsay or MasterChef could throw her a challenge that she couldn't handle. Earlier this year, I traveled with the KRM crew to the state capitol in Frankfurt for the annual Refugee and Immigrant Day. We stood in front of the capitol building as speaker after speaker came up to give their voice and their support and their advocacy. Each of them introduced themselves in this way. I'm Rabbi so-and-so from Temple so-and-so, and I'm a Kentuckian. I'm Representative so-and-so from such-and-such district, 
and I am a Kentuckian. My name is so-and-so, I come from this country, and I am a Kentuckian. This refrain stuck with me for days afterwards. I thought about the trite but true idea that there's more that unites us than divides us. The same week, I saw a video going around the internet of famous names from the New York fashion industry repeating a similar refrain, I am an immigrant. So a few thoughts crystallized in my mind. I thought, one, there's no shame in stealing ideas, especially good ones. Two, don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. Do something. And three, most importantly, hey, my restaurant's not open yet. I still have time to do this. <laughs> I rallied my friends and their friends, and in a matter of a month, we created the I'm a Kentuckian video, sponsored generously and quite appropriately by Kentucky for Kentucky. Many hands make light work, as they say, and many, many hands made this happen. We worked off a really simple idea. Wherever we're from, here we now are. We're immigrants, we're refugees, we're Kentuckians. We filmed some beautifully diverse faces, all laying claim to this, our home. We created and posted the video, we made shirts, we held a fundraising event at Smiley Pete Publishing, we opened our mics to songs, stories, and poems, and of course, of course, we had great food from local restaurants. So here's the truth of the matter. I did these things for selfish reasons. While perhaps giving and altruistic and even compassionate, I had other motivations. In a year with a political climate of this country, felt like it was going to hell in a handbasket, I wanted to feel better about myself. I didn't want to wake up every morning, look at Facebook and despair. In a social media world of internet trolls and echo chambers, I wanted to connect with real people in the real world. I needed to get offline. And of course, let's be perfectly honest, I like the recognition, I like attention. Here I am in front of a crowd of people with a microphone. <laughs> and once I realized these motivations, I started to feel a little bit guilty. Guilty that doing good felt good. But now that I say that out loud, it sounds a little bit silly. So I wipe that guilt from my mind. As I've built my career and personal brand in the last three years since MasterChef, all these thoughts have been in my mind. As I navigate my way through the local food world, I realize that my favorite restaurants, shops, and businesses have one thing in common. They're all run by do-gooders. They connect with the community. They give back. They treat their employees well. They have mastered the art of doing well by doing good, a skill that I was determined to learn. As I talk to many of these small business owners, as podcast guests and as friends, I realized two things. Their motivations came from a genuine place, rooted in altruism, generosity, and true compassion for their community. And two, as importantly, they were smart about it, and they didn't let it hurt their bottom line. We're ultimately in business to make money. You take a $1 item, you make it better, you charge $2 for it. But we don't have to be Exxon. We don't have to be Walmart. We don't have to be Monsanto. We can do better by being better. And being better members of our community becomes part of our brand. Nudo Nirvana in Berea is as renowned for its giving back as it is for its steaming bowls of Pad Thai. West Six Brewing has become Lexington's multi-purpose activity room. A cup of Commonwealth, like any good Game of Thrones house, has its own motto. Embrace community, serve others, create culture. And they more than live up to that creed. These were the leaders I sought to emulate with my own business. When I was first invited to speak at Creative Mornings, Atomic Ramen was mostly theoretical. I hadn't gotten down to the nuts and bolts of opening and running a restaurant yet. As a sole proprietor, the process was much more daunting than I had ever thought. During the year and a half of the inception and conception of Atomic Ramen, and most evident during the months leading up to the opening of this, my first restaurant, it began to dawn on me how many moving parts were involved in such an undertaking. Lease negotiations, insurance, kitchen design, POS software, hiring and training, 
pricing and buying equipment, permits, oh, and the food. Months and months and months of menu development, experiments, tests, counting down the pounds of pork bones, the ounces of shiitakes, the grams of soy sauce. Along the way, I was plagued with a palpable and recurring sense of imposter syndrome, which, by the way, being on national television does not cure you of. In fact, it probably makes it worse. I was constantly asking myself, am I ready for this? Am I up for this? Have I bitten off more than I can chew? But I had one not-so-secret weapon on my side. I know lots of people. Three years of hosting and producing my Culinary Evangelist podcast has connected me with Lexington's deep and rich food scene. Between my 200 plus podcast guests, many of whom have become dear friends, many of whom are in this building, I had access to centuries of experience behind the cook line, in front of the register, and in the trenches of restaurant life. But still, I was hesitant to draw on their collective wisdom. I was afraid to look weak, inexperienced, like an imposter. But here's the thing. I never had to ask. They came to me. They offered me advice. They connected me with business contacts. They told me war stories and cautionary tales and hilarious and grimace-inducing recollections of utter failure. And every time I felt my stride wobble, an arm reached out to right me. Every time my overthinker's brain went into hyperdrive, a veteran voice would tell me, chill. Every time I felt stuck, a rope, a branch, a hand would reach out and pull me out of the pit. Here's an encapsulation of the first week of business here at the barn. I had to borrow two hotel pans from Smithtown Seafood, a quart of sugar and 200 cups from Pasture, and a whole bunch of napkins from Crank and Boom. We were now neighbors. We were roommates. We were compatriots. We're all in the same boat. We're trying to make a living, keep our costs down and our sales up, and trying really, really hard not to read those week one Yelp reviews. <laughs> really hard. But we all have time. We all make time to help each other to compare notes, to commiserate, to lend literal cups of sugar. Does it matter if looking out for one another stems from compassion or self-preservation? The why doesn't matter to me in the least when we give and give willingly. I'll leave you with a quote from Anne Frank. No one has ever become poor by giving. My investors are gonna be very happy to hear that. <laughs> Thank you.